Welcome to AETCM, the emergency medicine channel. Yeah. A 71 year old male presented to ED uh, with breathlessness since one day which was associated with fever and cough. On initial 10 second assessment, patient conscious oriented obeying commands, airway uh, patent, patient can talk and was not able to complete one sentence, no pulling of secretions or strider. Was able to talk or? Was not able to talk. Was was can can, can talk but oh. was not able to complete one, one sentence. sentence. Okay, fine. Breathing respiratory rate thirty two per minute. Saturation seventy five percent on Dromire. Patient using his accessory muscles of respiration. Mm -hmm. Circulation BP one seventy bar ninety mm mercury. Pulse rate one not three. All peripheral pulses equally felt. Okay. Disability GCS fifteen by fifteen. Bilateral pupil equal re, equally reacting to light. Exposure temperature was 98.6 degree Fahrenheit, GRBS 160 mg per deciliter. Adjuncts to primary survey, we had done an ABG, we showed pH 7.392, uh, PCO2 was 74.2, PO2 is 38.8, lactates was 2.6 and bicarbonate was 44.2. Respiratory acidosis? A pH? 7.392. Not acidotic, no? Okay, so basically, I mean, from pH, we cannot say it is acidosis, right? PCO2 is high, but Seven. it is very well compensated kind of exam. Are you sure about the pH? Just 7.39? Uh, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, ECG, there was sinus tachycardia. Uh, mm -hmm. We had done four USG tests for lung sliding movements, which was positive. There was no pneumothorax. Mm, history. 71-year-old uh, male who is a known case of COPD, mm -hmm. uh, dyslipidemia, diabetic, Presented with con complaints of breathlessness since one day. He had history of fever and cough since two to three days. Fever was high grade, not associated with chills and writhers. Cough was expectorant with yellowish sputum. No history of any chest pain, palpitations, orthopnea, PND, altered mental status, and hemoptysis. On examination, patient conscious oriented, no pallor, ectrocyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. Mm -hmm. Respiratory system tachypneic, respiratory rate was 30 per minute. Uh, upper respiratory tract is normal. Uh, he had a barrel shaped chest, uh, no drooping of shoulder, no supraclavicular or infraclavicular hollowing, no unilateral flattening of chest. Chest movements are bilaterally reduced. Palpation, position of trachea is confirmed, requires chest movements. Mm -hmm. uh, on auscultation, bilateral scattered V's and Krebs were present. All other systems were within normal limits. Okay. Uh, we had taken a chest x ray. Uh, it showed tubular heart, hyperinflated lung fields, diaphragm pushed down, and bilateral low was on haziness. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the diagnosis infective exacerbation of COPD. Mm -hmm. Okay, where do you say it is infected because at this point? Fever, okay. fever with cough uh, and cough with yellow, expectoration of yellow sputum was present since two days okay. and presented with acute onset breathlessness. Mm -hmm. since. Hmm. Okay. Right. So, uh, such a patient comes. Okay, we have a definitive background of COPD in this patient. Now, this patient comes with new onset breathing difficulty. Right. What are the things which you are going to be uh, looking forward like during assessment? And what are the findings going to indicate? Um, um, uh, whether he is in respiratory distress or not. Okay. Um, in chest movement, uh, unit. Chest movements, we have to look for okay. in a moment. No, the key questions we are going to ask is one, is it just a simple exacerbation of COPD? That will be the so first and most common diagnosis, right? So, then what what is the uh, trigger for that? Is there an infection? These are the two broad questions which we are going to uh, answer when we are examining the patient, right? So, definitely you are uh, looking at the patient, you are getting decreased air entry, probably uh, V's. Okay, those kind of things, yes, definitely more towards a COPD kind of thing. And that information is going to be augmented with your blood gas findings. If there is evidence of uh, respiratory acidosis, again, it is more towards COPD. And other, other findings which is suggestive of an infection, again, uh, shows that it could be an infective component. But all patients coming with a background of COPD with breathing difficulty need not always be COPD exacerbation also. So, in though that's a situation where you are going to think about other differentials also, which could be, a, is there a cardiac component? Okay, definitely with COPD already long existing, there could be a new coronary event or there could be features of other left heart failure, things like that. So, always look for additional components, rule out any cardiac component. Okay, that will be one thing definitely we are looking at. We have to also look for any 
other complications related to COPD, right? Non, it need not be just an exacerbation. Are we looking for forwards for a pneumothorax kind of thing, a bullet rupture kind of things? So that will be the other differential which we are considering. Hypoxia if it is persistent, not improving with NAV. Definitely think about complaint of uh, pulmonary embolism or an, a thrombotic event kind of thing. Okay, so any uh, acute breathlessness in a patient with COPD need not always be an acute exacerbation. During your preliminary uh, assessment, always keep other differentials in mind and once you are presenting the history, at least indicate that you have looked for other differentials and that is negative. Clear? Okay. So, here you examined and you examined and you feel that there is no air entry. So, before going into x-rays and things like that, there are the certain things which is expected from the ER physician, right, in this patient. What are they? So, the basic management you can start, right? The basic management you can start. So, what so, forms the first line of management in COPD? That's the question. Or nebulizations can be given. Okay. And oxygen. Oxygen? All COPD patients are you going to give oxygen? What how what is the principle behind giving oxygen and what type of be your targets? Saturation should be between 88 to 90 in COPD patients. Okay. Um, now why is it so? Like uh, because uh, there is a, uh, the hypoxia is the trigger for the uh -huh. uh, breathing. Uh -huh. So if we um, el eliminate the hypoxia, uh -huh. um, the respiratory uh, when um, dry will be. Mm -hmm. Reduced. Mm -hmm. So, is it going to be like 88 to 92 for all COPD patients? Have you not to comment at this point? How will you? How are you going to target your oxygen saturations in COPD patients? With the pulmonary artery hypertension or without pulmonary artery hypertension. Okay. If it is without pulmonary artery hypertension, then ideally we will choose the target around 80 to 90. Mm -hmm. The patient is having pulmonary artery hypertension, and if the patient is having requirement of 80 to 90, so we will manage. So, then we keep around 95 as the target. Okay, so uh, the broad principles remain uh, same as he told, but the thing is that each patient will have a reset. Okay, there will be people whom you will be find that they will be comfortable on an 82, 84 and all chronic COPDs. So at the end of the day, it will be depending upon the patient's comfort. Okay, a patient who comes to you, your saturation is around 84, 85, chronic COPD established, proven diagnosis, he is not tachypneic, you need not give him extra oxygen. Okay, so the, the answer will be no, it is not an absolute number of 88 to 92 for each patient. It might vary to a lower end also. So, just before, before because you saw a saturation of 85, do not put the patient. It will be a clinical assessment at that point. Okay, and uh, what will be the lab investigations which probably indicate that the patient is used to hypoxemia? Um, polycythemia. So, basically look at the hemoglobin and HCT in the uh, point of care test itself. So, if it is showing that hemoglobin is like 15, 16 and all and hematocrit is above 40, definitely it is a surrogate marker saying that the patient is used to a chronic hypoxemia and we need not uh, rush to give the patient a lot of oxygen. Okay. So, that will be the uh, next teaching at that point. So, definitely oxygen is needed. It again does not mean that in the tachyptic patient saturating at 86 and all, you are not going to give oxygen. No. Okay, so it will be a clinical judgment, it is a very comfortable patient, it is okay to uh, 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 delay the oxygen at that point. Okay, fine. So now, uh, the patient is tachypneic and hypoxemic. Definitely, there, there you are going to target as we told, 88 to 92 is a reasonable target. Fine. And uh, the uh, why we should not give oxygen also, you have told. The, the thing is that you should not be hyperoxygenating these patients with mask or NRBM and giving like keeping the saturation above 100 is asking for trouble. Right, fine. So then you go ahead with the ABG, right? In ABG, what are, what are things you are going to expect? Um, carbon dioxide retention. Okay. Here you told that pH is already very well compensated. So did you check for the compensation? Calculate for uh, for acute for every. Uh, so here it is a chronic case, right? It's a chronic COPD kind of situation. So re chronic respiratory acidosis for every ten, you can at least compensate for four, right? So, uh, what is the PCO2? 70. 74. So, if you are keeping 40, it is increased by at least 30. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, expected bicarb will be approximately 22 plus 14, uh, 22 plus 12 at least. Yeah. So, here what is the PCO2? 44. 44. Again, probably there is a compensation. There is compensation, but there could be a co additional bicarb yeah. also here. Is the patient on diuretics or anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, no, no, no. Okay, we have to look for other yeah. causes then. Okay, so definitely it is it is a chronic issue where the bicarb has been increased in in slowly because for uh, for the compensation of PCO2, but again the values are little higher than what the expected co compensation. 
clear so that will be your interpretation of the abg per se okay fine now you have started the patient what are you going to start this patient on saturation what do you say like 75 percent definitely you are going to start the patient on some kind of an oxygen uh, supplemental oxygen so what are the options for supplemental oxygen can be a uh, nasal or nasal okay, okay what is the uh, uh, range of oxygen which we are usually delivered through nasal bronx 2 liters absolute number or <laughs> what's the range two to the question four. was yeah so basically 2 to 4 is what we usually deliver by nasal bronx anything more than 4 you usually go for a mask and if it is more than 12 usually we prefer yeah. an rbm okay fine right so here definitely uh, uh, most likely from the looks of it the patient is more like an impending respiratory failure accessory muscles being used so we need we may not consider uh, nasal prongs as a first line kind of thing he might need something else what is it NIV. NIV. definitely yeah, this patient seems to be a candidate for NIV. Yeah. so so once we are putting the patient on NIV, then definitely we are going to give oxygen through the NIV itself we are not going to consider nasal prongs right fine before initiating NIV, what are the things which you need to assess in a patient probability of uh, failure of NIV by hacker score okay tell about the score uh, um, well, first is heart rate okay uh, then so what score can you repeat the name of the score hacker score hacker score okay fine. then heart rate if it is less than or 120 or more okay. than or equal to 121 mm -hmm. then acidosis ph mm -hmm. um, between more than or equal to 7.35 mm -hmm. then uh, 7.3 to 7.34 7.25 to 7.29 and mm -hmm. less than 7.25 mm -hmm. then uh, consciousness that is GCS mm -hmm. if 15 0 uh, the uh, values 13 to 14 11 to 12 then less than 10 then uh, oxygenation uh, that's O uh, PaO2 or FiO2 and uh, last the respiratory rate mm -hmm. so this the, what what does the score indicate like uh, uh, the failure of the NIV cell okay so this is more like a predictive score for whether the patient will respond to NIV or not that said clinically what are the things you are going to uh, examine or, uh, or look forward before keeping an aid yeah is the patient conscious good no? definitely you will need a patient with a good sensorium fine then any uh, vomiting or uh, second secretions what's the problem with vomiting and an AV? um very last minute mm, more specific so basically by keeping an AV where all the air is going it is not that the air is going through only one tube mm -hmm. right so there is aerophagia can also happen right the abdomen can get further distended so that is our concern with giving an AV okay definitely we want the lungs to be inflated but some air is going to definitely go into the stomach also so again that that will add on to the risk of further vomiting so that is our concern okay fine so a person with recurrent vomiting altered sensorium or not a good sensorium definitely we are not going to consider an AV anything else pneumothorax yes definitely pneumothorax fine so pneumothorax here you have felt that you have used an ultrasound that ruled out pneumothorax fair enough anything else Facial, anything? Uh, any facial. Yeah, yeah. Basically, for keeping NIV, the NIV to succeed, you need to have a good seal without air leak. So, if any facial deformities, any uh, yeah. big beard and all, we cannot attain a good fit, naturally that patient be will become a non-candidate for NIV. Yeah. So, always make sure that the patient has a good fit. Okay. Then, anything else? Okay, basically these are the uh, the bare minimum things you need to make sure that you are you are looking forward before keeping the NIV. So how will you initiate an IV? Um, like will you just uh, what are the things which you are going to keep before before uh, starting the patient on an IV? Like how are you going to do that? Do that. Okay. Uh, first we need to explain the procedure to the Good. patient, and we need to arrange the patient in the proper position. Okay. Uh, to explain about something. <coughs> mm -hmm. Maybe emetics if needed should be given initially. Okay. Uh, then all the contraindications should be ruled out. Mm -hmm. uh, then based on the ABG, uh, we need to set the uh, settings of the... What are the two basic settings? Uh, okay. Okay. What will be a reasonable kind of universal setting which we usually... Mm, to at least to six. Okay. On the ABG, you will adjust the settings after you everything and make mm -hmm. sure the series of mm -hmm. Okay, okay, fine. So, there are other settings also, right? There are going to be other settings like other than your IPAP and EPAP, depending upon the mode. So, here usually we start with an ST mode, spontaneous time mode is what usually start. And as you told, we have to maintain a difference of IPAP and EPAP, right? 
it it mean it will not be always 16 is to 49 dollar right if you are starting with 16 you have a lower peep with that at least the margin of at least 5 to 6 okay so you st you set your ipap and epap as i told 12 to 6 but what you are going to monitor is the minute ventilation in the nav machine you are looking for the minute ventilation and minute ventilation whatever target we are setting in right here at, le at least something close to above a, uh, 8 to 10 at least we are we are going to aim for right so that minute ventilation to achieve we will be titrating the settings. The second thing to remember is that you should not always be starting at a very high EPAP. The patients usually won't tolerate it. So always start at a low EPAP, then uh, uh, give it for a few minutes, then kind of upright rate to attain patient comfort. So if you're starting with an EPAP of 10, IPAP of 16 and all, usually patient will say discomfort and you won't be able to continue with the BiPAP. Okay, fine. So you start the patient on NIV with a reasonable setting achieving a specific minute ventilation and tidal volume, right? Fine, then, so uh, that is done. Before BiPAP, anything else? Primary management. So we came to oxygen, that's why we kind of bypassed and got into uh, NIV. So before even starting NIV? Bronchodilators. Exactly. No? The first thing will be bronchodilators. Definitely this patient has significant bronchospasm as he told, hypoxemia. So we are going to start this patient on nebulization. So what what is the recommended nebulization and what is the dose? Uh, can we beta 2 agonist like salvetamol? Okay. Uh, or um, ipratropin tromide. Okay. Um, so usually it is always Saba is a short acting uh, uh, beta agonist will be a first line plus or minus ipratropin. Uh, okay, fine. So what's the dose usually? So, it, uh, both in COPD and your bronchial asthma, it is going to be 2.5 micrograms, of whichever you are starting. Usually, we start either salbutamol or liver salbutamol, right? So, for how, how long you are going to give the first cycle? And how do you give? Like, three cycles. Can okay, each cycle will be 20 minutes. Okay, so you start with a short acting beta agonist nebulization, as I told, 2.5 mcg, uh, and it is given over 20 minutes, then you repeat it. Okay. So it will be usually SABA followed by protropium and the cycle can repeat for 20 minutes into 3 sets. It will be a reasonable kind of a starting point. So that next, what else? Um, hydrocortisol. Okay, steroids. So parenteral steroids, definitely yes, has some role. Uh, and what is the usual preferred kind of drug? Anything is uh, fine, but uh, if you are uh, uh, giving like prednisolone, if it is for, uh, what you have to calculate is 40 mg of prednisolone equivalence you have to give, whichever steroid you are giving. Okay, so use that as a standard and then calculate the remaining things. Methylpred, good enough, hydrocortisone, whatever you are giving, just make sure that you are giving an adequate dose. Fine, then. Now the patient remains tachypneic in spite of the first cycle. And steroids. Myself can make it. Like, there is no strong evidence for magnesium sulfate in COPD. Whatever evidence we have is more towards asthma. But definitely we can, as a bronchodilatory kind of rule, we can definitely try it. But you can keep on repeating the doses of uh, uh, your, your uh, yeah. nebulizations. Okay. Is there any, any uh, uh, superiority of nebulization over MDI? Yeah. Nothing much. So basically, a patient who is who, who can take a good quality MDI is almost equivalent to a nebulization. Okay, so uh, so just always uh, keep that if you have MDI, just start the patient on MDI itself. Okay, fine. Anything else with regard to this? So you have tried your uh, Saba, you have started the patient on NIV, you have given the first dose of uh, uh, steroids also. Okay, now we are into like uh, six hours. Of the, uh, uh, say, say, let's say two hours and what will be the, the patient is not improving much. What are the objective things you are going to assess for? Yeah, follow up blood gas. Okay, F follow up blood gas if you are showing that there is an improvement of acidosis that kind of gives you a justification to continue with your kind line of management. But if the PCO2 is going up, patient sensorium is going down, definitely think for alternative causes also and also what will be the next option in situations like that? You might need to consider the patient for intubation if the sensorium is going down. No, you cannot long, no longer keep the patient on NAV. Hmm? Okay, fine. Moving on to intubation. What will be the key things? Is there anything anything specific we are going to look forward for 
during intubation of COPD patients. A bit correct. COPD intubation, anything specific? Ambu bag ventilation, anything? Do you not hyperinflate the. Oh. Yeah. So usually COPD intubations are reasonably, the procedure of intubation we usually patients tolerate because these patients are well used to hypoxemia and crashing during intubation is little less likely. But unless you hyperventilate and not, you are asking for problem. So basic oxygenation, go for RSI, ketamine probably can be considered definitely as an agent. Okay. So post intubation also, you should not, you should be looking for ventilator related issues, air trapping and things like that. So. Again, we'll go for a prolonged kind of expiration, kind of whatever principles we told in an IV, you know, slightly higher uh, tidal volume with a prolonged expiration will be the things which we are looking forward and allowing allowing adequate expiration. Okay, we'll definitely don't want kind of auto peep to be generated, air trapping to happen. Okay, fine. So those will be the things which we are going to look forward during the ventilatory phase. Right. Then again, what what other immediate management? This patient, you feel that it is a what what kind what was the trigger infective trigger so what is the other drug which we will be considering during initial management antibiotics fair enough so copd antibiotic what are what what will be the ideal antibiotic in copd and macrolides can be mm -hmm. okay um, wait so you told about macrolides so what are the common macrolides which we use acetromycin okay acetromycin if you are giving what's the dose MG. Okay, 500 mg for initial 3 to 5 days is the recommended dose for if you are using macrolides. Any other macrolides? Yeah. Clarithromycin again, 1 gram to 500 mg. Okay, fine. Anything else? Second will be nampipenicillin, that is basically your uh, amoxicillin clavulinate. Augmented is a reasonably good choice. Okay, if you are giving 625, it is TID. If you are giving 1 gram, it will be BD again for 5 to 7 days. Okay, so macrolides or ampipenicillin with uh, this uh, clavulinic acid, then so these will be the two broad lines. Uh, uh, guidelines you also say quinolones, but again in our kind of setting we usually reserve quinolones, right? If you are giving quinolones, again it is going to be levofloxacin will be the first line. Okay, fine. Then, so definitely this patient in ER itself we are going to give a first dose of antibiotics. Then, anything else? If it is okay, definitely if if, uh, if it is a seasonal kind of scenario and you are feeling that it is uh, your initial lab parameters are suggesting more towards a viral kind of picture, definitely you can cover with the only respiratory antiviral, what is it? Oseltamivir. Oseltamivir, what is the dose? Uh, 75. Okay, 75 mg BD you can start. Fine. What are the two? Pro okay. Basically, you have tablets and syrups. Okay, Tamiflu. Fine. Then, so you are covering with an antiviral also. Fair enough. Anything else? ECG. What happens to what are the common ECG findings in COPD patients? Common findings? Sinus trachea. Sinus trachea again. And if at all, what is the common arrhythmia you see in uh, COPD patient? If you ask, it's more common towards atrial arrhythmias, including multifocal atrial tachycardia, AF, kind of things. Okay. Common ECG will usually be sinus trachea. Okay. What is that? More than three. There are more than or equal to two. Distinct P morphologies. Okay, fine. Right. Um, so that is with the ECG. What's the ECG in this patient? Any any findings? Sinus trachea. Sinus trachea. Okay, fine. So ECG we have looked at. Basic labs. Have we got the basic labs? Yeah, WBC counts for fifteen thousand. Okay, again more towards an infection. CRP. One twenty-two point seven. Again more towards an infection. Fine. Uh, right. Anything else? Any other gross lab parameters? Any issues? No. no potassium is post normal. 2.5. Okay. What's your concern regarding potassium in COPD patients? Uh, can be uh, reduced due to nebulization. Okay. Okay. Uh, severe hypokalemia is not something which we are very happy with. Right. Again, with we are going to give multiple doses of nebulization there. Probably we will keep a higher threshold to kind of correct the potassium. Okay. Fine. So that's with potassium. Anything else? Real functions, liver functions are reasonably okay, right? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, right, so that is with the basic labs. Now, uh, you have started the patient on antibiotics. You have, yeah, one thing will be to rule out other cardiac kind of issues, as we told earlier. Okay? Uh, you are, if you are having a suspicion on diagnosis, definitely BNP will be a, another kind of uh, tool to help us distinct. Any role of procalcitonin? 
Okay. Uh, Procalcitonin is one thing which will kind of tell us whether it is a predominant gram negative, uh, predominant bacterial kind of infection. If it is very high, more towards a uh, gram negative pathology. That is the indicator. But that does not mean that a negative Procal rules out uh, a, a, a bacterial infection. So, never rely on Procalcitonin to start antibiotic. Okay. Just say that the Procal is negative, so this patient does not need antibiotic. For initiation of antibiotic, Procalcitonin is not a good tool. If you have clinical suspicion it's in a patient like this with, uh, with uh, fever, with elevated count, with productive sputum, definitely start the patient on antibiotic. But Procal will have a role in de-escalation. Okay, if, you, if, if the patient had a high Procal in admission and Procal has come down in due course, that can help us de-escalate the antibiotic. So that is the role of Procal. Fine. Okay. So, uh, x-ray x-ray findings, what do you say? Um, a tubular heart. Mm -hmm. Hyperinflated lung fumes and diaphragm pushed down and bilateral lower zone haziness. Okay, what all these findings are going to indicate that it is a long standing process, it has been having a long, long kind of disease course. Okay, so that is with the basic investigations. Management, we have told the basic principles of management, including ventilation. More than that, when you come to ventilators and elderly patients with COPD, never jump into intubation. Okay, always have a good conversation with the relatives, set the goals of care because if at all we are going to intubate, we might be in for a long game. It will be kind of a difficult extubation. If it crosses the initial few days, then definitely it is going to be a difficult to be in kind of a scenario. So, already an established COPD with multiple hospital admissions all uh, with, with uh, poor quality of life, always discuss before intubating this patient. So, only if everybody is on board, otherwise it is justified to go for a do not intubate kind of uh, strategy. Okay. So, that is with regarding the basic management. So, now uh, there can be another scenario where you have a, a, a patient with COPD coming with the first or second hospital admissions. We have uh, treated him and now he is being discharged. So, what will be the key, key advice which we need to give the patient apart from the routine kind of stuff? Mm, uh, vaccinations. Good. Good. What all vaccinations? Um, um, influenza. Oh. Um, Pneumococcal, it's influenza definitely yes. COVID again has come into picture now. So, if you have a pandemic happening and all, if there are reported cases in the in the vicinity, definitely an option for COVID is also there. Just know that. Okay. And uh, then again regarding home BiPAP. Okay. NIV is some, home BiPAP is something which can, which has been proven to decrease hospital admission. So, definitely if the patient is requiring BiPAP, especially at night and all, definitely you have to discharge the patient on BiPAP support. Okay, anything else? Okay. Prophylactic antibiotic, there is some evidence to uh, say that if the patient has recurrent hospital admissions for COPD, a prolonged course of macrolides 250 mg, azithromycin 250 mg has some role in preventing recurrent infections. Okay, anything else? We covered most grounds, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, anything to add? Nothing? Okay, right, thank you.